Good afternoon and welcome to our series Diplomacy, Your Questions, Our Answers. Uh, today we are obviously talking about the war in Ukraine uh, under the title A Watershed Moment for Diplomacy in Europe. Uh, we know what's going on uh, right now, but uh, I think it is our task uh, as Europeans uh, to look forward and to see what the implications and consequences of this war uh, might be uh, and to find way, ways out of the situation. Uh, I'm happy that uh, two of our young alumni agreed to discuss this uh, this afternoon and I welcome Katarina Grifscha and Diego Shishanov. Shishanov and uh, moderator will be Viktor uh, Vekic who is at the moment a student at the Diplomatic Academy. So welcome to, to all of you. Uh, let me say just a few words. Um, Obviously, after the occupation that is happening right now by Russia in the Ukraine, the countries involved and we all will need diplomacy again. But uh, what sort of diplomacy is possible in such, such a situation? Can we learn from former conflicts? Uh, what will, be, will be, uh, be the outcome of this? One outcome, uh, if I may say, will certainly be that the post-Cold War order in Europe has ended. And this sounds uh, very simple, but this is a dramatic change uh, of, uh, it's a watershed, as we say, uh, what's going on. Uh, Russia has, without any legitimate reason, uh, started a war against a European a neighboring country. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, it is very clear that uh, there is a new sort of Cold War starting right now. Uh, the difference to the old Cold War will be that it's not about capitalism against communism, obviously, but it's about democracy against dictatorship. Again, this is a very, very radical wording, but this is the situation as I at least uh, evaluate it at the, at the moment. The question is, what went wrong? Did diplomacy fail uh, or was it simply that one of the actors in the, on the diplomatic scene was not accepting that diplomacy is the only way forward in a, in a global system which can be uh, stable? Um, and uh, what makes me optimistic about that we are resilient as far as democracy is concerned are these uh, happenings of the last few days which showed that the European Union is suddenly a very unified on its reaction to what's going on, uh, that uh, 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 NATO uh, has made very clear that it is the only security instrument which works uh, for European countries, that's the perception of countries like Sweden, Finland, other countries, that Germany has dramatically uh, changed from this trauma of the, of the Second World War experience uh, to uh, the given realistic approach uh, to invest in security and uh, also to support the Ukraine in the given situation uh, with defensive uh, weapons. Uh, and it's also very clear that the transatlantic relationship uh, is back again on the diplomatic scene. Uh, how can we make use of all this? vis-a-vis uh, -vis an isolated Russia. And again, this is a, a perception, I think, that we will all share that Russia is isolating itself more and more. So there is a lot on our table to discuss, but actually uh, uh, for this uh, time, we want to discuss it not with the known gray old experts uh, uh, from our security institutions, but we want to discuss, discuss it with young uh, alumni of the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, with this, I give over to you, Victor, for moderating our, our afternoon. Thank you. Well, first of all, a warm welcome to our dear guests and colleagues to this discussion on this war in, on Ukraine and to the implications that it will have on the or field of study and a field of, of work, diplomacy. Um, let us at the beginning take a moment to reflect and send our hearts and thoughts to the people currently suffering and whose suffering is yet to come. Well, today we will talk about, uh, well, the only constant in life, it is change, 
this change from peace to war, this change from neighbors to enemies, change from talking to shooting. And most importantly, changes in our perception and understanding, which may lead to changes in our institutions and actions. So that we will hopefully see the world change to a better place soon. I would love to warmly welcome our valued guests and former Komilitonen, both DA alumni and both Ukrainian. We have Katerina Krivsha, a BA uh, has a bachelor's in international information and uh, German translation in Kiev, and this holds a certificate of European studies from Strasbourg. She has done the MICE program here at the DA with us and has worked uh, in, as an intern in the Ukrainian embassy in Germany as well as Austria, and also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ukraine. So cur currently you're holding the, uh, the position of policy team assistant in the American Chamber of Commerce in Kiev. Thank you very much for coming. And I would love to introduce to you Yegor Shestov. He's a former ETA student at the DA and today he's focusing on the geopolitics and the inner politics uh, of Russia, its history and the intricacies of the current regime. He's the CEO of PsyTech and Wholesale. He's a filmmaker and writer. So thank you too for being here this evening. So first of all, I would love to clarify that this is an open discussion and uh, anyone who has questions in our audience at any time may write it on the Facebook uh, comment section, it will be transported directly here. And uh, I will see, I will try to drop in the questions as they are fit. So there will be a Q&A later on, but don't torture yourself until it arrives. You can also ask earlier. So with that, I would love to begin with you. Uh, Yegor, uh, to start off on your view, well, there is this kind of dogma that if you want to understand why a country is reaching outward, you have to look within. So where do you see this background, this lack of, uh, was there a lack of communication? Was there a, where is the diplomatic failure that has that has happened, or are there other reasons that are running parallel? Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Ambassador. I'm very, I'm very glad that uh, here we can call white white and black black because apparently today this is a problem. I think Orwell would be very proud. Uh, we are now in the director's cut of 1984 because we have two very different worlds. But uh, to understand the reasons behind the Ukrainian conflict, you don't necessarily have to study geopolitics. You don't necessarily have to understand politics or have a degree in international relations. You have to dig inside the head and you have to look at the psychology of human beings. I will start off by reading a fable by Ivan Krylov, uh, The Wolf and the Lamb translated by Vladimir Gurovich. A weak one's always guilty towards strong. In history, one finds a lot of illustrations. Here we proceed with these investigations and by a fable show, the thesis is not wrong. A lamb in a hot day came to a brook to drink, but who could think a hungry wolf was wandering around? He saw the lamb, at once began the chase, but then, to give the case an ample lawful ground, he shout. Insolent fellow, how you dare here by your dirty snout to roil my water clear with silt and sand? 
for such a sauce and impudence. I will tear off your head. And yet, your gracious wolf would let me know I'm drinking up the stream some 50 yards from him, from which he could conclude his water can't I royal. So do I lie? Well, such impudence, yet first time I met, harsh punishment for that you'll have to undergo. Oh, I remember here two years ago, you also spoke to me extremely rude. But how I could? I'm only six months old. And already that bold? Well, it was your brother. Haven't any? Well, then uncle or your father, you have so many kin. Your dogs and herdsmen, each one I've ever seen. You all wish me just evil. You do whenever can, but trust me soon, we shall be even. But why am I to blame? Shut up, I'm tired to hear. Do I have any time your puppy falls to prove? I really want to dine. This is your fault, my dear. The wolf then caught the lamb and dragged him to the grove. Some surprisingly sober and still sane Russian politicians are making the following observations. If you have a bottle of a really expensive wine, the one you've been keeping on for a special day, the one you've been keeping on for so long, you might as well have it now or tonight because there might not be tomorrow. And they might be right given the circumstances. Uh, do you know that we are lucky to be alive today? Because in the middle of the night, a Russian army, in hopes to take by force a Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which in fact happens to be the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, uh, started artillery shelling it. I would like to repeat that. Russia artillery shelled a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. But that is, of course, that's what war is in Ukraine. Uh, Russia is fighting Ukrainian war exactly how it fought in Chechnya. First, they were sending in just flesh. Uh, Russia has sent in so many young adults, younger than I, younger than Katerina, to fight a war they weren't aware of. 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds. Russian army has lost 10,000 people within the first few days of war. That's more than in the first Chechen war, more than in the second Chechen war. As much as in Afghanistan war, but excuse me, Afghanistan war lasted a few years. But you know what Ministry of Defense said this morning? They said that Russian army prevented a terrorist attack that Ukrainian fascists were planning on a nuclear power plant. Russian Ministry of Defense said that it was Ukrainians, the nationalists, who tried to blow it up, to put the blame on Russia. And Russian army saved us all. So it turned out that the town madmen were actually right, all of them, said Russian political scientist Ekaterina Shulman. Have you enjoyed your life so far? I hope you have, because the life from now on will be very, very different. Ukrainian war is one of the most pointless wars I have ever seen, is one of the most stupidest wars I have ever seen. It doesn't have a cause, except for one uh, crazy idea of bringing back Soviet Union. And the reason why I brought up the fable is because all of these talks that Ukraine is threatening Russia, that Ukraine is a threat, that NATO is a threat, that it's the West that keep coming closer to Russian border, all of that is nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Take a closer look at what Russia demands from Ukraine. Russia wants denazification excuse me denazification of whom we have uh, a president who has jewish roots he is a native russian speaker from kharkiv they uh, bombed uh, babi yar where 150,000 jews were killed and buried 
among Ukrainians and others. That's the denazification. Uh, what kind of security guarantees Ukraine needs to give Russia, I have no idea. But we know that right now, Russian army is shelling everything they have. Are, are they shelling, they're shelling everything they see. Apartment buildings, schools, they're killing civilians, they're collecting uh, uh, Geneva Convention violations like Pokemons because they don't care and they never did. That's exactly how they were fighting the first Chechen war, then the second Chechen war. That's exactly what they did in Georgia. That's exactly what they did back in 2014 when the Ukrainian Russian war first broke out. And what you see today is nothing new under the sun. The reason why this conflict has happened and uh, is now what it is, where we question the existence of the entire humankind, is because all of this time we tried to diplomatically argue with those with whom you cannot diplomatically argue. And now, unfortunately, it's too late for sanctions. It's too late uh, to voice your concern because at stake we have humanity. And whatever measures we take right now, we have to be very careful. You have to understand that Russia uh, lives in its own world. I mean it, Orwell would be very proud. Maybe actually he would be surprised because all of the Russian, uh, oh, I'm sorry for saying all, very many Russian people still support Putin. They think that West tries to murder Russia. Uh, they think that it's the West to blame. They think that what's happening in Ukraine right now is just a civil war between nationalists, fascists, and very brave Russian-speaking Ukrainians and Russians. But even if you show the pictures of the destroyed buildings, the destroyed towns, and you talk to your Russian friends and you say, wake up, please, we have a disaster. They say that very well, you deserve it. Apparently you deserve it for choosing freedom. Apparently this is the price to pay for freedom because that's, that's the only thing Ukraine has ever wanted to live its own life. So all of the sanctions right now, they can also be counterproductive because Russians firmly believe that this is exactly how West is trying to murder Russian state. And so, from a propaganda point of view, all of this is working against us. So we have a very difficult case. This is a very difficult nut to crack, but we have two parallel worlds. We have sanity and insanity. We have the light and the darkness. This is the ultimate Armageddon. And we have the nuclear weapons and Ukraine is a state of nuclear power plants. And to fight a war in Ukraine and to commit a genocide in Ukraine and what's happening right now in Ukraine is indeed a genocide. Either you don't, either you don't have the information and if you're living in a bunker, chances are you don't have the information or something is very concerning and it's time for a psychological diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, very well skeptic view of how the events are to unfold um, we can surely understand the possibilities of escalation and uh, to that we already have a first question uh, from Mogis Zevdu Teshon he says it is great to see you both Diego and Katerina that you have been good friends at the DA and he is asking on what legal grounds and security arrangements, if any, would NATO provide direct military assistance to Ukraine? This is now the Armageddon scenario you are talking about. Um, so if the assistance is made militarily, 
wouldn't that make all the members of NATO a legitimate target for attack by Russian force? Um, uh, Katerina, do you want to answer or should I? I think it was a question directed to you. Ah, okay, okay. Um, I understand why Ukraine has to fight 1v1. I mean, don't get me wrong. We are very thankful for the support. Uh, I do agree, the world has gotten together, and I think that this uh, threat united Europe, and I think it united the world. I never, never I thought that I will see such, such a support from the world. This is correct. But uh, Ukraine is still fighting one versus one. In fact, Ukraine is fighting one versus two or one versus three, because Belarus will soon attack as well. Belarus already is shelling Ukraine not with the troops directly, but we know, we, we know how it works. And apparently Pridnistrovye has been, uh, pro has been conducting some uh, military drills. So this is something to keep in mind. I understand why we have to fight 1v1, because if, if NATO suddenly joins in, then Putin has a perfect, uh, uh, a perfect, uh, television image and he will just say well i told you it's nato against uh, russians i told you that it was nato that was forever that was always the problem and so i do not believe that nato will fight on the uh, ukrainian side nato is more likely and the world is more likely to sacrifice ukraine as a price to pay for the remaining freedom unfortunately this is the case that said, Ukraine desperately needs weapons, desperately needs tanks. We desperately need planes and fighter jets. And uh, our President Zelensky yesterday on a conference, on a Q&A, has said ex exactly this. And here I can only repeat these words. If we are to fight one we one with a country like Russia, then so be it. But we need military support, indirect military support. We need weapons, we need guns, we need planes, and everything the world can provide. Okay, thank you, Yegor. Uh, so you have, as you have said, uh, indirect military intervention would lead to an escalation that could end in total devastation. So on this happy note, huh? please, I'm giving the word to you, Katarina. Um, you're from now talking to us from Brussels and uh, you have a background in many diplomatic um, su surroundings. You've been in different embassies and you're currently working at the, um, at the American Chamber of Commerce. What is your view on these happenings overall? What is, and we have talked about the, the military threat, but do you see some other things going on behind the scenes. What? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, being Ukrainian, it is very hard to be at the same time a diplomat in this situation. Uh, it's very hard to detach uh, emotions um, from the objective view. And that is why I would like to to get you on a little ride with me, how I view the situation, why my views are the way they are. So imagine that you wake up one morning and your life is destroyed. Suddenly you have no home to return to. All your relatives are under constant threat of death. You're a refugee who could think that in another country was just a small suit of your belongings. Imagine yesterday you had the job of your dreams in a vibrant and beautiful city. And today the city is in ruins. You're alone, you're left only with a big fear that everyone from your family will die. Imagine losing your six year old daughter and 14 year old son in the shelling in the residential building in Kharkiv, or losing your pregnant wife during the shelling of the hospital. Imagine being pregnant and giving birth in the bomb shelter. Imagine losing all the money and the apartment you worked your whole life for after a missile hits your house. Imagine becoming homeless and jobless just in one night. 
that is my life today and that is the life of millions of Ukrainians. Just nine days ago, my life was just as normal as any of yours. Today, I begin my every day with just a single message to my parents. Are you alive? Well, they sit in the bomb shelter for the ninth day in the row. In a place where I grew up, where I went to school, where so much happened. 28 children have been killed with the weapons of Russian invaders in Ukraine. And their death is a clear sign to me that the diplomacy in this case did not work out. I truly believe that diplomacy is an important tool for the functioning of the world. But in the case of Ukrainian-Russian relations, diplomacy just has reached its limits. We have tried so many diplomatic solutions since 2014. And you see, all of them have failed to deter Putin. For a leader like him, full invasion of Ukraine just out of his own interest, we, we don't have any arguments for that, uh, is just more important than respect for international law, or even more important than economic prosperity of Russia, as we can see. We can see more and more sanctions against Russia implemented, but at the same time, the number of Ukrainians dying every day is also on the rise. So it, it probably doesn't mean that diplomacy is dead, but it illustrates the need for the integrated approach, where diplomacy would be accompanied by for instance, military support from NATO, or where diplomacy will be just completely reformed as an institution. I am I'm confident to say that the ongoing war in Ukraine uh, started by Russia will be crucial for the shaping of the entire world. And once we allow Putin to get away with his aggression, with impunity, every one of us will suffer the consequences. We know that the world has turned its back on Georgia in 2008 and allowed Putin to occupy Crimea was little to no cost for him. And thus, this facilitated the war we have now in the middle of Europe. And I think it's not the time to detach oneself um, from the war going on in Ukraine. And I really think it's the time for the whole world to represent a united front to fight for the respect of sovereign states, not only Ukraine, but all of the states, to fight for democracy, to fight for freedom, so that tomorrow Russia does not knock on your door. Diplomacy doesn't form uh, public opinion, but public opinion in most cases is what forms diplomacy. And therefore, I urge each and every one to take a stance to voice your opinion in your own country so that your government provides more and more support for Ukrainians to really desperately need. And also, I would like to use this opportunity to appeal to all the Russian people. We share the responsibility to stand for what is right. You might be scared or you might have considered yourself to be apolitical, but it's just not the time to separate yourself from the disaster that 44, can you imagine 44 million of Ukrainians experience, but because of the decisions that your government takes. I think that only by standing together and opposing Putin's regime, we can reach peace. The longer this war will continue, the more usual it will become for the rest of the world, but not for us. And for us, current circumstances are just blood and destruction. As Yegor has mentioned, this is a genocide. And stopping this war means stopping the genocide of Ukrainian people. It means allowing us to rebuild, to rebuild our normal life and actually to give us back what is rightfully ours, the right to our sovereignty. And finally, I would like, I would like to say how proud I am of our people how proud I am of the president who refused to flee the capital saying that he needs ammunition and not a ride. I'm proud of the civilians who tried to stop Russian tank with their bare hands and who are now professional in making Molotov cocktails. And I'm proud of the Ukrainian farmer that stole Russian tank with a tractor. And I would like to quote Yuval Noah Harari who noted that Ukrainian people are resisting with all their heart winning the admiration of the entire world and winning this war. Thank you. Thank you for your heartfelt words, Katerina. I think you're kind of um, hitting on the same spot that many of our uh, 
the watches are mentioning, like Dejan Dešimir Tulimirovic uh, asked about the Minsk II agreement and the Steinmeier formula. And uh, Bessie Beza has, has pointed out that these have both failed to secure a peace or to secure um, any peaceful progress of solving the tensions between the Ukraine and Russia. Also, uh, we have, like a few years ago, even uh, there has been the talk of uh, John Mersheimer at the University of Chicago, as Georg Halbgebauer has pointed out, talking about Ukraine being the West's fault insofar that if the West pushes towards Ukraine, there can be no talks and uh, there can be no compromise and that he will uh, stop short, just stop at almost nothing to ensure that uh, the Ukraine cannot be used militarily against Russia. So um, we have seen that many uh, efforts have been made, such as sanctions, such as uh, the cutting of many cultural and uh, economic ties, almost all of them. And uh, these further escalations are only being, being grown uh, as, as we can see, as you have said, Diego, uh, that uh, through the shellings and the, the, through these indiscriminate bombings across Ukraine. Now the question is, the question remains, what, what has diplomacy achieved and where has it fallen short? Where does it need to be expanded? And how has it helped in organizing the aid that Ukraine is currently um, getting from all over the world? Please. Shall I start, Katerina? I think we have to be very clear here. Um, all of these negotiations are not used to achieve uh, a desired outcome. They are more of a theater, more of a game. You have to understand that there is one side that sincerely cares about the human life and the loss of human life, that is Ukraine. And then there is Russia, who using the Soviet Union tactics, just sends more and more and more and more people. Today, they're passing a law that everyone who participated in peaceful protests will be sent to the frontier to fight in Ukraine. They are planning to mobilize half a million people more and send another half a, people, half, half a million people more. The reason why they are now committing crimes against humanity is because I believe they were misinformed that Ukraine, they actually, they still can understand that Ukraine is not Russia. Kuchma uh, told that uh, 20 years ago to Russian officials that Russia is not Ukraine and Ukraine is not Russia. But you can clearly see that Russia uses the Chechen war tactics and Syria tactics. In fact, they are just shelling civilians right now at this point, because that's how they fight wars. Uh, obviously making me question, do they really care about the loss of life? Do you know that they still haven't officially confirmed that they lost 10,000 soldiers? They claim that they lost 500. And for the first five days, they were denying that they had any kind of losses. They said the losses are zero, zero. Uh, anyway, point being, uh, the only negotiation that will truly prove uh, fruitful is between Zelensky and Putin, direct uh, talk, and not with the 30 meter table, as Zelensky said yesterday, but right here, right now, you and me, and ideally live so that everyone can see 
the arguments and where everyone can think for themselves. But we know that Russia will not do it because this war is a made up war for made up reasons. And I disagree that NATO has anything to do with this. Uh, okay, actually, we, we know exactly when this, when this began. Uh, when uh, Putin moved away some of uh, the troops from the United States frontier, in, uh, I believe in Cuba, I believe, I might, I'm not so sure, but we know that the change happened in 2007, right when he gave a speech uh, in Germany in parliament. And that's when he said, no, now you, you, will have to, you will have to listen to Russia. You will have to talk to Russia. He took it personally and he still is taking it personally. And the failure in Ukraine, he is taking personally. And he cannot embrace the fact that some Ukraine doesn't want to be with Russia, doesn't want to be with him. So where did diplomacy fail? Coming back to that question. Well, it would be very nice if we could actually respect the rules we ourselves set. Uh, Crimea was the first alarm. Um, the world didn't react. The world didn't respond. Uh, Ukraine was dragged into Minsk agreements. We now know how Minsk agreements ended. But this is the price you pay for waking up uh, for being in slumber, for waking up too long. I think that we are now awake. I think uh, the world now understands where the problem lies. But again, the price Ukraine had to pay and the price world will still pay, the consequences we will yet see. And so to not, uh, where did diplomacy fail? Well, we don't respect the rules we set ourselves. As simple as that. I could add to that. Um, I think studying as a DA, um, discussing so many conflicts that have been happening around the world, we always use this um, golden rule, do not negotiate with terrorists. And that's where I think the problem lies because terrorists, they don't, do not commit to their promises. And while Ukraine was always committed for a peaceful solution, we always wanted a peaceful resolution of this conflict. The Russian side was rarely keeping their promises. And that's what we what we see now. If you want a peaceful solution, then you have to have two sides committing to what they promise. One is not enough. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, thank you for these words. Uh, we have talked about how diplomacy with uh, Russian officials has often been used as some kind of how you have said it, Yegor, um, uh, Soviet Union tactics to prolong or to co cover other operations. Now, looking at the multifaceted approach that diplomacy can offer and looking at the harsh laws that are being uh, made inside Russia, as you have said, sending protesters to the front. Can one imagine a form of diplomacy, of public diplomacy aimed at the Russian people? We have already seen projects like uh, the web pages depicting the captured and dead Russian soldiers. Is there more to be done before one can say that the Russians have, that, that the military option is the last justifiable one. I mean, we are in the middle of war. I think it is too late to use um, media. We still can, but we don't have other option right now. We have to answer militarily just because we are being, um, there are occupants on our land. So of course, there is a lot to be done. And I think Russia is in a desperate need of democracy for people to, to know what is real, to get the real information, to, to have um, media, which is a huge problem right now, uh, to have free and open media. But at this point, the, our only tool is military. In regards to Russians and diplomacy, 
Ukraine's only problem is that Russia intervenes and fights war. This is Ukraine's only problem. Ukraine doesn't care what's happening inside Russia. Russia right now is turning into a huge concentration camp. And it looks like this is only the beginning of it. Like, and, and that's why I have to keep, keep coming back to 1984. Uh, Orwell was right. <laughs> he knew. Uh, but you will be surprised that 70% of Russians support Putin right now. And they support the war in Ukraine. And uh, I am lacking words to say. I don't understand. Uh, this is like a Stockholm syndrome on a scale of a country. You have to understand, like, it's like, it's, it's like asking, is Trump a problem? Of course, Trump is a problem, but Trump is a reflection of the society. Trump is a reflection of what's going on in a state. And if someone is electing Trump, perhaps this is a scream for help. Perhaps this is, uh, this is how uh, people uh, show uh, express their dissatisfaction but you have to understand Putin does not exist in vacuum there is Putin's Russia a phenomenon of Putin's Russia and Putin's Russia goes well beyond the leader you have people who justify everything the Russian government is doing and no amount so far no amount of information and no amount of talking could breach this wall, this information wall, like don't underestimate the power of television, especially if you watch tw t television for 20 years, you live in a different reality. And all of the arguments, it's like, uh, it's like with the nuclear power plant, Russians shelled the nuclear power plant in Europe today. If this is not a war crime, I don't know what is. But today in briefing, they said, we protected it from Ukrainians who try to commit a terrorist acts. And guess what? Most of the Russians will go and they say, we're losing our people, but oh my God, Putin should send more and more because uh, these fascists, they clearly don't know when to stop. And here, I frankly, I don't quite know what to do, to be completely honest. So uh, this is exactly what I am aiming for, to see what what else can be done so uh, as you have elaborated here uh, most are motivated by the single source of communication of information being allowed and uh, the thing is that as you have stated over 20 years this has been very referred back to the autonomy of the state and sovereignty of of inner business but in a war-like state, as we are today, what measures could be made by, not by Ukraine, maybe right now, because it has more urgent business to attend to, but by the, the world, the solidaric society that wants to contribute not only to a military effort, but on an effort to improve the uh, the possibilities of also inner Russian peace. As you've said, the the regime is cracking down hard, and the people have either to fall in line or to get sent to the front or into camps, as you've pointed out. So is there wiggle room? Do you see any wiggle room do you see any means of improvement there even if it would mean a breach of sovereignty as i said it's very difficult to save those who don't want to be saved it's very difficult you cannot inv invade a country kill the government uh establish a one-time election and say, you now have democracy, F fly my beloved country and leave. It doesn't work like that. Putin's Russia is not a phenomenon of one or two or three people. As time will go by, I'm pretty sure many will understand. 
But you have to understand that despite all these difficulties, it seems to me that the majority of Russians support the government, support what Russia is doing, and support the confrontation between Russia, NATO, and the rest of the West. And this is serious. What can you personally do? Well, if you have Russian friends, maybe give them a call, check how they're doing, ask what is it, what do they think about a war? Uh, remember, they don't call it a war. They call it a special military operation. Excuse me. This is not a war, of course. This is a special military operation. Ask them what they think about the special military operation and if they support it. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, don't underestimate the Stockholm syndrome. People are afraid in Russia. They are scared. And uh, I also, I, I, I didn't say people will be sent to concentration camps. I'm saying explicitly that Russia has become a concentration camp. It is one entire concentration camp right now because all of the independent news outlets are leaving as of today and yesterday. It means that the access uh, to information is no more. You will only have the television or rare uh, telegram channels, uh, rare uh, pro-Russian or uh, for Russian, uh, uh, Russian financed states, uh, news outlets. Uh, and uh, a very natural reaction, if you are scared and if you are very scared to admit, is denial. Russian citizens right now are in denial that their country, the country that won the Second World War, is committing the same crimes the Nazi Germany was committing. But even, you know what, I actually, I think that we should respect Hitler more because he at least seemed to care for his soldiers. He at least seemed to care for what's going on in his state and with his people. This is not the case in Russia. People are getting poorer. They are losing numerous of their best souls, their youngest people on the Ukrainian frontier, and they are more than happy to sacrifice more. And uh, I think that it's because of fear that Russians deny the fact that this is the case right now. And they ignore the information that is shown to them. Here, I think that a rhetorical question would be, if all of the soldiers that died during the Second World War, the Soviet soldiers, the ones that died when fighting with Nazi Germany, if they were resurrected, and they would see what's going on in Russia and what Russia is doing to Ukraine. I'm wondering, what would they say? And what would they think? Mm -hmm. Well, about... Talk to yeah. Russians. Please, Talk Katarina. to... So, oh, sorry, please. No, no, go, go ahead if you wanted to finish. Uh, yeah, just a, a, small, a small thing. Talk to Russians. Try to breach this wall. Try to explain to them what's going on. But I'm afraid that there is only one way. Uh, and uh, you, you, uh, luckily, time is on Ukrainian side. Luckily, Russia will soon no, no longer be ready to afford this war. But this will also mean that they'll be using ever, ever bigger rockets. They'll be using their other arsenal. And I do not. I, and I and I don't think that use of nuclear weapons is impossible at this point. And that's why I'm telling you, if you have an expensive bottle of wine you were keeping, have it. There might not be tomorrow. But from terms of in soft power, I don't really know. Well, I can also recommend that you go and pray. I think if um, I support Yakor, of course, uh, but if, if we are looking at a solution on the international arena, on the international scale, then we have to consider that Russia, one of the reasons Russia has attacked Ukraine is what because Putin uses the Western world, 
will not support us. It's, it will be us against Putin. And what is going on now is incredible. Definitely, um, EU states have consolidated so much. It seems that NATO is finally overcoming its crisis and finding its purpose. Uh, but at the same time, we still are lacking this unified front that would help Ukrainians. That is why more unification, in my opinion, more unification on an international arena among Western states and Ukraine is considering itself a Western state. And uh, if uh, if you were listening to Ursula von der Leyen, that's what she said, Ukraine is Europe. So more unification on that front would help so that we could deter Russia, this, so that Russia knows that we have a unified response against it. And that would be absolutely incredible solution, I think, but I don't know how realistic it is. Um, well, you, what you both mentioned is this, uh, how to approach the Russian or the Russian side, the Russian people more directly in this manner as to communicate, as you have said, call them, ask them what they're doing. Do you, there are more than uh, what Ono has said, Ono Dikov, so there are many, two, more than 2 million Ukrainians, Ukrainians living in Russia today, many have friends and families. Do, they, do you think that if, you, if there is a more support to them directly, that they could be a source of change or at least of slowing down destabilization inside of Russia? maybe even uh, sowing doubt about the regime. Is that something that is being overlooked right now? It's, it's difficult to understand how concentration camps work from... Uh, uh, how do I explain it? Uh, Ukrainians in, uh, living in Russia right now uh, are now experiencing a lot of oppression and are experiencing political pressure. Yeah, cars with the Ukrainian number plates are stopped and checked regularly on the streets. Uh, Russian police knocks on Ukrainian doors in Russia, interviews people about what is it they think about the special operation, uh, ask them whether they think that any kind of political movement, alternative political movement in Russia is nowadays possible. Six years ago, when I was still traveling to Russia, uh, I had a small interrogation in the airport and I was asked if someone will be planning a coup like Maidan in Russia, would you call us? Uh, I hope... I hope you understand. No, like, again, you cannot solve the Russian problem for Russians. They have to do it for themselves. Only Ukraine can solve the Ukrainian problem. No amount of money, no amount of financial aid can do what Ukraine must do alone. Uh, you have to live your own life and you have, to, you have to change your state. And I do not see the willingness to change from Russian people. Chances are this is because they are afraid. Chances are is because they are very misinformed, but I do not see it. And no amount of Ukrainians and Russians, except for maybe on tanks, can change that. Um, to add to this, because you were just describing the situation, how, how um, Ukrainians in this matter are, are treated, now in Russia, it is, Russia is called out. More, many people have uh, asked about this. Uh, Russia has called out now the the uh, it is declared martial law. Do you have information on how this looks like on the ground? Have you information about how this really? Uh, what what does this in actuality mean? What? What steps do you think are they preparing? You have talked about similarities to, to uh, concentration camps towards, towards political prisoners or political uh, to, towards the opposition. What can we expect? What can we picture under this Russian martial, martial law? I, 
I don't quite understand your question. Could you please rephrase it a little bit? Um, how does the, I'm asking you if you have information or information on how the martial law in Russia translates into reality. What differences are being made? You have now talked about the Czechs and the police visiting uh, different citizens, be they Ukrainian or, or else. What does this martial law entail in Russia? Which measures have been taken? If you have information on, on this topic. If I may interfere, there is no decision yet uh, on martial law in Russia, fortunately. The Russians are denying that, that they intend to do martial law. But maybe what I say now may not be true tomorrow. Um, ambassador is correct, but you have to understand. Uh, just look at what Lavrov and Peskov and Putin were saying all this time, they were saying, oh, my God, you must be mad that Russia will invade Ukraine. You're crazy. All of this is just Western bullshit. You, Russia will never do that. Guess what? They did. Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum. Ukraine gave up on a third largest in the world nuclear arsenal and received a guarantee of sovereignty from Russian Federation. Guess what? Don't sign treaties with Russia. Don't believe what Russians say. Russians will most certainly, in the nearest foreseeable future, pass the martial law. I can almost guarantee that. Reasons are many. First of all, you have 10,000 deaths. And you can't hide them. Because there are mothers who are now crying, who are calling, uh, who are calling Ukraine, who are asking for information on their sons. And chances are they will hear that their sons are dead. Uh, in the worst, in the better case scenario, they are imprisoned. They were they are lucky to survive. Uh, you have to understand that this has been going on for ages. No one has seen or no one talked about the human rights violations that were happening in Russia. And trust me, you don't have to be an opposition to face the violence. The state institutionalized terror and violences. I'll, uh, I'll remind you how Putin came to power. Um, FSB staged uh, explosions and they bombed the, 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 they bombed the buildings in Moscow, in Volgodonsk, claiming it was Chechens. It got so crazy that by accident, police capture, nearly captured FSB, who were trying to conduct another explosion. But, but apparently people don't know. This has started long ago. This has started years ago. That was the beginning of the reign of terror. And as years went by and the state was permitted to function, it has gotten worse and worse. Look at what people do. Look at what uh, police is doing to people in prisons. Uh, you will read the reports, which are truly horrific. If you look at what has ha been happening in DNR, in LNR, in those freed republics, read how people are raped, read how. Uh, we have to stay diplomatic here. I will not go into details of how people were tortured. But you have to understand that the tortures that were uh, the most horrific tortures you can imagine have been taking place every single day in Russian state for the last 20 years and were institutionalized. They became the norm. And so uh, martial art will just allow to put people inside their homes so that they cannot protest. They no longer have to worry about anyone going and saying no to war, no to war. Uh, they will not have to worry about those people. Uh, actually, uh, the, reports are, uh, the reports are that people uh, that are imprisoned and are beaten in Moscow and St. Petersburg and other countries, they hear policemen uh, roar yes to war through the helmets, just so you will understand. 
yes to war. This has become the norm in a state that won uh, in Second World War and said never again. So martial art will just allow total freedom, the one they've been long looking for, to maximize the violence potential. Okay, so uh, Katarina, do you have a few words to this? I just hope that the law will not be implemented. And since it's not in place, I don't have any information about, I mean, it's still not working, you know, mm. uh, but let's just give our prayers. So it's, it's not implemented. It's, of course. So, but I would love to hear your opinion. Um, Yegor has already kind of uh, let his opinion uh, no, uh, be known about the trustworthiness of Russian you know, Russian guarantees, or you know, he, as Maria Tsvanigova asks, after all this, is uh, it isn't easy to sit at the same table with Putin, but do you believe that it is rational to ignore Putin and his demands? And uh, especially looking at uh, the security throughout Europe and the consequences it could have for the world. So the question is, is whether it's worth it to sit uh, at the same table with Putin, if I understood correctly. If it stops the war, then yes, our president is more than ready to conduct negotiations. However, I cannot tell you uh, how committed he will be to his promises. I mean, the, the, the Putin side, the Russian side. Both Minsk processes, um, they just didn't work out. We cannot really hope that the third process will, um, will be efficient. We will sit, we will negotiate. Hopefully we can find a peaceful solution. But as I mentioned before, two sides must be committed, not just Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and, and do you see uh, the Russian side committing to any such, or can you picture? The if the Russian, Russian side committed. was committed to what they promised, there would be no war in Ukraine right now. They violated every promise they made. They violated any international law existing. They violated Geneva Convention. Are they trustworthy? No, they are not. But I was still hoping that their promises will be true. Yes, we do. Is, uh, can I add? Uh, can I add yes, maybe I will. I will add just another okay. short thing, and then we can see see at the whole picture. As Sergio Stoika has pointed out, of broken promises. Now, of course, it is the um, old Russian mantra that uh, the NATO and EU expansion towards the east was also promised to not well, go any further. And uh, it has been a long-standing narrative to protect itself from, from the West's grip. So uh, Putin stated that the US is a bully and may have poked the sleeping bear too much. Do you think that this is in any way accurate? Or do you think that without you know, Western intervention or, or expansion, things would have done, would have gone differently. Ukraine wouldn't be such a point for Putin. We were not in NATO and we were not in the EU and yet we were attacked. So it doesn't matter what the West does, it matters what Putin thinks at the moment. Victor, this is exactly why I started with the wolf and the lamb. Because if you need a reason to fight a war, you will make one. Uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, Russia claims that you, a genocide is happening in Ukraine. That's why they have to intervene. And guess what? They come and they create a genocide. Uh, if they need uh, a picture for the television, they go stage a theater and they create it. That's, uh, that's the beauty of 1984 era. Uh, it's happening right here, right now. No one ever promised in no written form to Putin that NATO will not expand. Nobody ever did. But we have Budapest Memorandum, we have Geneva Conventions, we have uh, United Nations Charters to which R Russian Federation committed fully, and we all know how this is working.
out. And so to say that all of this is because uh, of expansion of NATO, that NATO is closer to the border. Okay, but imagine this. If, if Ukraine is suddenly under Russian rule and Ukraine is now Russia, so NATO is closer to the borders because Russia is moving closer to NATO borders. Or how, how, what, what, is the, what is the logic here? Uh, shortly. Sorry, perhaps I talk too much. I know this is my problem. I just have things to say. But briefly, look at the demands. Look at the demands from the Russian side. Denazification of Ukraine in a country where a president is Jewish. Are you serious? What kind of denazification? In Ukraine, you could freely speak Russian and Ukrainian. Kharkiv is the biggest Russian-speaking city outside of Russia. Never there was this problem. This is a made-up cause. It's, it means nothing. So all of these reasons about denazification, deoccupation, uh, demilitarization, of course, mil uh, what kind of demilit demilitarization can we talk about if Russia came in, took Crimea, stole Crimea pretty much, then tried to steal uh, Donbass uh, region, and now tries to st steal the entire state, what kind of what kind of uh, guarantees should Ukraine give to Russia? Excuse me. Uh, and lastly, Putin refused to talk directly to Zelensky. And I know exactly why, because Putin knows he will not survive this failure. He will, there is nothing they can talk about because one side says white is white and another one will say white is black. And that's why Putin refused. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, seen uh, some some mentions uh, about your uh, the the wording of some acts by the Russians, uh, like uh, some are are criticizing the usage of the word genocide, especially looking at the proportions that. Uh, the word used to embody of mm, several millions directly and systematically being eradicated. So, do you do you still think um, that genocide is an is a, is an aim of Russia? Is a is it appropriate to describe the situation that's going on? War is war. War is war is very very filthy, very dirty, very bloody. But do you perceive this as being part of a bigger population removal? Just to analyze if the word uh, genocide is, is appropriate in this context. Okay, if it has to be a few million, let's wait. It will be a few million. They are now using uh, grads and uh, artillery, and they're using vacuum bombs on cities like Kharkiv, right here, right now. And okay, I would rephrase. I still say it's a genocide, but it's not a genocide against Ukrainians. It's a genocide against humanity. They are murdering everyone they see because they've realized they cannot win the war. And that's why they would rather make it flat and yes they are shelling shell, uh, they are shelling uh, uh, just apartment buildings they are killing civilians who try to escape russia excuse me also was uh, not uh, willing to take uh, the uh, to organize the humanitarian corridors and and russia uh, does not want the bodies of the russian soldiers back I can only agree with what Igor is saying, and I would like to get back to, to the question. I'm not sure if it's a question from uh, from the audience or for you, from you, Victor, but do we have to massively die to persuade you that this is a genocide? Do it have to be millions of people so that it's a genocide? People unarmed are being shot in, in the streets in some of the uh, small villages just next to the border. If a man leaves the house, 
and this this village is occupied by Russia, and then he's being shot. Maybe it's not a genocide because we hate you Ukrainians, but it's a genocide against just one nation that you perceive as a threat. Okay. Thank you very much because um, it has come up uh, quite a few times as a distinct to it's and it's sometimes important to distinguish the the motivations behind these these uh, killings these killings so we have also other questions uh, a question for you uh, miss krishva from edith schlafa and uh, she's asking about the well about the scenery this is taking place there are men, aggressive men at every side. Do you think uh, or do you see that women-led diplomacy would have would have maybe opened up more ventures, more venues of, of action, of cooperation, coordination? I mean, it's if it's a good diplomat, then what is the difference, what gender he or she represent, right? We have an equality. If it's a qualified man, a good Russian or Ukrainian diplomat, then I think they would make the right calls just as women would do. And again, we have Ukrainian diplomats who are especially responsible for the human rights situation, for the humanitarian aid situation in Ukraine. They're very vocal. They uh, voice their concerns, opinions. They work very hard. Um, they meet with Russian diplomats, so I, I don't think anything would radically change if there will be more women. But if there will be someone on Putin's place, maybe then the situation would be different. Thank you for your insights. So um, now we are we are looking at the possibilities of ending the the slaughter that is going on, and. Uh, Salka Klose is asking, could you think, could you think, could you assume it as, as perceivable that a ceasefire can be reached or under which circumstances could a ceasefire be reached? And uh, is there anything that, for example, Austria or Van der Bellen could do? Yegor, do you want to go first? No, wait, why don't you, you go, go first? first. You can go first. Okay. Um, I think the ceasefire could be reached if the Russian side would agree to it. Ukrainians would definitely go for a possibility for ceasefire, at least to, um, to get humanitarian aid to those regions that are in a desperate need and that are cut off. Uh, of the supplies and our president was very vocal about it. He would like to make these green corridors. He would like the ceasefire at least to save those people who are struggling the most. But we unfortunately do not get the response from the positive response from the other side. Uh, whether Austria could do something or not, it is hard to say at the moment. If there would be some negotiations that would involve more countries than just Ukraine and Russia, then yes, maybe Austria would uh, could play um, its role, but for now, these are solely uh, two sides that negotiate. Mm -hmm. But we are very grateful for the humanitarian aid that uh, Austria provides. And I know there are so many people in so many villages and cities in Austria that want to help, that are volunteering, and we appreciate it very much. Ukraine doesn't want to fight the war. It never wanted to fight the war. The only thing it wanted was to conduct politics the way Ukraine wanted it to be. Ukraine has uh, a practice, apparently, of being a free state. And the only thing Ukraine is defending right now is her borders and her freedom. Ukraine does not want to fight this war. I do not want to lose my friends. I didn't want to lose my home. I didn't want any of that. Russians just need to go home. This is the only way. Uh, you cannot cease fire with those who want a war. And this is the only problem we have. 
because one side wants peace and another side wants a conflict. Well, then let us hope that uh, the Russians come to a realization soon and that Ukraine may stay on its path of remaining a free state and uh, well, wherever there is aid to be given, we hope that it increases and the situation stabilizes as soon as possible. Well, with these words, I really want to thank you both for coming and thank you all, you all uh, for watching or following this stream. Thank you also to our Ambassador Briggs for being here and the DA to organize this meeting. It has been a great pleasure to talk to you. If you have any last words, please say it. Get it off your chest. If not, thank you very much for being here. And I hope we will see each other again under better circumstances. Thank you, Katrina. Karen. You want to say something? I'm just grateful for this opportunity to present our views, our opinion on the situation, and hopefully it will reach more people. And I would like. Sorry. I know we wish your country and your people the best. You know this all at the Diplomatic Academy on your, on your side. Thank you very much. It is very important to know. DA is our family in Europe. So thank you. Thank you so much for this unique opportunity. I am also very grateful. It is an absolute honor to be Ukrainian in this very moment and to see uh, my country do the impossible but uh, the support has been absolutely amazing never in my life i thought i'll see support like this from each and every single one of you and i want you to know that on behalf of ukraine i really want to thank you it means a lot to us and of course diplomatic academy our second beloved family thank you very much for this opportunity may the impossible become possible huh?